didn't think I was actually gonna try to lift that, do you? Friends, that's 315 pounds. I would have killed myself. There is no way. I used to bench press back in college, but we're talking over 30 years ago. Oh, but imagine this. Imagine someone came to me and said, Jeff, if you can lift 315 pounds, one, one bench press will give you a million bucks. You know, a million dollars, that's a, a lot of money. I, I'd try it. I'd give it a go. I'd probably crush my chest. It would be a mess, but I'd try hard. And upon failing, I'd reconsider and I'd say, all right, uh, boy, I just lost a chance on a million bucks. And I wonder if I just tried a little harder. Like maybe I'd say, you know what I need is a good shot of protein. That'll do, a little protein and another try and I'd fail again. Upon reconsideration, I may say before I pass on a million bucks, I gotta try one more time, maybe a shot of oxygen and trying harder. Yeah, no, I'd still fail. Every time I would try harder, I would fail. But there is a way. There is a way that it can be done. It does not involve trying, but training. Friends, do you know the power of training over trying? Imagine this. Imagine I were to reduce the weight down to a more realistic amount, and imagine I were to, you know, do it for as many times as I could. You know, towards the end, it would really burn. You know, that's the thing about exercise, is it hurts. But as they say, no pain, no gain. And then imagine that I were to do lightweight exercises maybe three times a week for a few weeks, and then add five pounds and work with that for a few weeks, and then add another five pounds and work with that. Over time, I would change. I would get stronger and stronger. That's the magic of training. And if I did it consistently enough, carefully enough, I would get to a place where, yes, I could lift 315 pounds. Now, that ain't going to happen, but it could. Friends, I want to clarify the powerful difference between training and trying. You know, the same applies to the spiritual life. So many people think that the essence of Christianity is trying harder to be a better person, but that's not it. What Jesus invites us into is a lifestyle, following him with spiritual exercises that when done consistently over the months and the years, it changes us. So let me show you a really cool verse. This is 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. It says, do exercises that help you grow spiritually. Physical training is of some good, but spiritual training is much better. Friends, no pain, no gain. If you're willing to endure some spiritual exercises that can be uncomfortable, that can be painful, you will grow. There's something about the way God made us that when we faithfully exert ourselves in ways that take us out of our comfort zone, that pain will be used by God to make us stronger. And little by little, we will be more godly, more like Jesus. And so friends, we're in a series called Silver Linings, and we're talking about how hard times and difficulties, the clouds, have a silver lining, a benefit that God brings. And here, week three, we're talking about discipline. Discipline is when God exerts a hardship, a trial on us. And we're about to find out that they can make us stronger. Are you, are you frustrated with your lack of spiritual growth? Do you feel sometimes like you're stagnating? You know, some of us look year after year and we recognize, man, I'm not making the progress in becoming more like Jesus that I think I should be making. Could it be that part of the problem is you're trying harder instead of training harder? 
The truth is that sanctification, this growth trajectory, it happens with our obedience. If we just expect it to happen and we're not ready to engage in the exercises that the Bible calls us to, we're just not going to see the growth. So let's find out how Zechariah grew. You know, he needed to grow. Last week we discovered uh, some of his weakness. Remember, the angel announced to him, though you and your wife are beyond childbearing years, your wife Elizabeth will be pregnant with a boy you are to name John. And I'll just read you his response once again. Verse 18 of Luke 1. Zechariah asked the angel, how do you expect me to believe this? He doubted. He, he didn't buy it. It's a sign of a lack of faith, uh, room to grow in Zechariah. Well, look what the angel says. He's offended. Verse 19, the angel said to him, I'm Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I've been sent to tell you this good news. How dare you call me a liar? You know who you're talking to? I am Gabriel, for crying out loud. Isn't that interesting? He goes on, verse 20. Now you will be silent and not be able to speak until the day this happens. That is the day the child is born. Because you did not believe my words. He is disciplined with muteness. He will have to be silent, can't speak, for the entirety of the pregnancy. Nine months, can you imagine that? Friends, this discipline that is enforced upon uh, Zechariah, it's, it's a spiritual discipline called silence. I want to talk more in a bit about spiritual disciplines. Spiritual disciplines are ones that we impose upon ourselves, various practices that help us grow spiritually. And sure enough, being silent, which... Zechariah has no choice in the matter. He's going to be silent for nine months. It can help you grow. But for now, let's read on, shall we? Verse 21. The people, that's the people outside the temple who are waiting for this guy to come out. The people were wondering why Zechariah was taking so long in the temple. When he came out, he could not speak to them. They realized that he had seen a vision for he kept making signs to them. You know, everybody waited. They would hear a word from the priest who exited the, the temple, providing some insight, some blessing. Zechariah wanted to tell them more than anything, but nothing would come out of his mouth, and he's just kind of waving his hands. They realized something big had happened, but they didn't know what. Verse 24. After they, that, that's Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth, after they returned home, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. Isn't that an interesting phrase? Elizabeth chose to enter into seclusion for five months, though celebrating and telling everybody what had happened would have been very natural. She chose for the first five months of the nine months of pregnancy to be in solitude, to stay away from the people. Why? What's going on there? This is actually another spiritual discipline, the spiritual discipline of solitude. We'll talk about that one in a moment, too. But let's speculate. I'm imagining that Elizabeth was looking at what her husband was going through, and that's the spiritual disciplines of, of silence, and saying, you know what? That's probably good for him. This calling that we have to raise the one who comes before the Lord, John the Baptist, it's a huge calling, and my husband is being prepared by God for that great calling. Maybe I need to do something, too. Maybe she chose just for her own spiritual development to enter into solitude for those five months. Maybe she knew that talking wasn't going to go well. The people would have come to her and said, we heard that something amazing happened when your husband went in the temple. What was it? And if she's going to explain, an angel told me that I'm going to be pregnant. People would be like, oh, sure, Elizabeth, that's special. You know, so she knew that questions would be asked and answers wouldn't be believed until the five-month mark is when you start to show when it's undeniable. And maybe at that point she's like, you know what, now 
Now I'm ready. You know, I got proof that the story I'm going to tell them is true. And so she waited. Now, I just want to point out that discipline can come in two ways. It can be God-imposed or self-imposed. In the case of Zechariah, the Lord inflicted him with muteness. In the case of Elizabeth, she chose to enter into uh, solitude. And, And so it is with us. You know, sometimes a hardship comes our way that's gonna grow us, and God brought it our way. In some way, God's saying, you know what? I'm going to discipline you. Like, for example, Hebrews chapter 12 is a a whole section there about God disciplining. It says in verses 6 and 10, Like a loving father, God disciplines us for our own good in order that we may grow in holiness. Just as a parent, a loving dad or mom will, will discipline their child. It's hard, but there's a silver lining in the suffering, and that is their growth and their development. So God, our Heavenly Father, sometimes imposes discipline, hardship in our lives because of our disobedience. Sometimes we can look at consequences of our sin or embarrassments or difficulty we're dealing with as a result. And that's God saying, you know what? I know this is going to be hard, but you'd agree you got to grow. Lean into this. Embrace the discipline with submission and humility. Walk in it and let it help you grow. Now, don't don't fall into this. Some people make the mistake of thinking that they're offering penance. You know, by somehow suffering, they're gaining forgiveness. No, 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 no. We get forgiveness as a free gift. Don't think that you're evening the scales of justice by suffering to pay for or make up for or earn forgiveness. It doesn't work that way. You may be experiencing discipline, so you grow. You already got forgiveness the minute you ask for it. That's a gift of grace. So if you sense that you're suffering as a result of In some way, because of your sin, embrace the suffering and say, God, use this in my life. I can tell you're trying to grow me. Now, I also want to be clear that not all hardship that God brings into our lives or allows into our lives is because of something we've done wrong. Sometimes it's just God saying, this will help you. I'm not sending it as a a corrective measure in your life. Uh, I remember when I was on the swim team, my coach Sometimes he would say, you know what, you guys were messing around. It's time for you to do some wind sprints. Uh, He called them no breaths. You had to swim across the whole pool as fast as you could without breathing. And sometimes he was correcting us because of misbehavior. Other times he'd say, let's do some no breaths because they make you faster. They make you stronger. It had nothing to do with misbehavior. So it is with God. For example, let me show you actually twice, Romans and in James. He says, rejoice when you face all kinds of trials because you know that they develop endurance, character, and spiritual maturity in you. Rejoice when you have hardships of all kinds. Kinds that you didn't do anything wrong. It's just God allowed it in your life because you know that it'll help you grow. So some hardships are God-imposed because of things we've done wrong, or maybe not not because of things we've done wrong. And then there are other hardships like Elizabeth where it's self-imposed. I suppose going to the swimming analogy would be like me saying, I'm going to go into the pool on my own and do a workout, including some sprinting no breaths, just because I know I want to make myself stronger. You remember what the verse we read uh, already, 1 Timothy 4, 7, and 8. Do exercises that help you grow spiritually. Physical training is of some good, but spiritual training is much better. That's not God imposing it. Like Elizabeth, that's self-imposed disciplines. And so, friends, I just want to tell you this. Hardship makes us grow. Whether God's bringing the hardship or whether we're choosing to enter into spiritual disciplines, all of these have the capacity to help us grow. So now, let's talk about a couple of those spiritual disciplines, the two that arise in our text. The first, remember, is that discipline of silence where uh, Zechariah was struck with muteness. Now, we're not going to be struck with muteness, but we can choose silence. Silence is a powerful 
self-discipline to help us grow closer to the Lord. Uh, you know, some people choose to spend some time. We sometimes call it our quiet time. There's that silence word. Because when we're quiet, when we're unable to talk, what ends up happening is we choose to talk to God. Inside, he becomes our only option. The, the discipline, the spiritual discipline of silence is really an elimination of options. When Zechariah didn't have the option of talking to anybody else, the only person he could talk to is the Lord. And similarly, when we're having a quiet time, when we're all alone and we're not listening to music or a podcast or anything, what do you do? You talk to the Lord. So often we don't connect with God because we're connecting with everything else. Uh, Friends, silence is so powerful. Can I even make this suggestion? Car time is a great chance to practice the discipline of silence. You, You can turn off the radio. So often we get in the car and boom, right away we're turning on sports radio or a podcast or music. And that's great and all, but occasionally to sit in silence. You're like, what would I do? You would talk to God. By eliminating options, God becomes the option that we focus on. So finding times in our lives to bring silence to bear, to take a walk in the woods with nobody, to find a place that is quiet and just sit there. Silence can be an eerie sound but a powerful way to direct our minds, our hearts, our spirit to connect with the Lord. Now, what was the one that Elizabeth self-imposed? It was the discipline of solitude. It says that she got away, that she stayed away from people and isolated herself. And yes, that can help us grow. Uh, Solitude is uh, less the elimination of options and more the elimination of distractions. You know, people and out and about, those things distract us. And when you choose solitude, you're trying to get into a place where you're distraction free or at least less distraction so that you can connect with God. Jesus did this all the time. The Bible tells us in the Gospels repeatedly, I read like 12 of them just in preparation for this message, that Christ would go to a lonely place, or sometimes it's called a quiet place, or sometimes a solitary place. Jesus needed it. He found time to go to the mountainside, or the lakeside, or the desert. One place he went to a house that no one knew he was at. Another case, he took the five-day journey to Jerusalem all by himself. Christ was looking for opportunities for solitude so that he could pray. And friends, solitude is so missing in our society. And let me tell you why. Beware of a false solitude. False solitude is time on the internet or time watching TV. You're like, hey, I'm all alone. But remember, if solitude is trying to get away from distraction, isn't technology distracting us? That's a false solitude. In fact, uh, uh, abstaining from technology is one of the best ways to experience solitude, to to take 15 minutes and be away where you have no computer, no phone. It's just you and God. Do you see the power of that? We are bombarded with information and distraction all the time. Now, there's a great benefit to technology and the information, spiritual information we can gain through Christian songs and sermons and this. But there is a place to put technology aside and say, I'm going to enter into true solitude. So it's distraction free and I can connect with the Lord. Let me me be clear that sometimes a solitude is an extended period of time. (laughs) I remember speaking of solitude and uh, silence. My wife was talking to somebody who told them about a Christian retreat center where they have multiple days of no talking. You go and you stay at this uh, kind of a dormitory-like retreat center. I went. My wife bought me one. and They gave it to me as a gift. Drove me crazy for three days. I'm eating with people. We're not allowed to talk. It was, it was, it was powerful. Really hard. Remember, disciplines are hard. It's a, it's a suffering that has a silver lining. But as I endured those days of not talking, of being out in the woods alone, 
I connected with God in a powerful way. Now, it doesn't have to be three days. It could be one day. Uh, some people say, I just need a solitude day, and they find a day off and they get away. For others, it's one hour or a half an hour. You can have minute retreats, if you will, where you just step out of your office and walk down the hall and take three minutes to look out the window and just slow down, free your mind to remember God. It's powerful what can happen in us. You know, when we break the routines, so often, see, that's one of the keys. So often we're caught up in routines, routines that dominate the way we think, the way we feel, the way we talk, the way we act. And yet if we break those routines and press ourselves into solitude or silence, all of a sudden the mind is freed up to recognize the presence of God, to think differently about life and see deeper truths about yourself, to realize priorities that should be in place. It's amazing how the Lord, by his spirit, can move your thought life. When you break your routines, get out of it. Spend a little time alone and let God push you in a new direction. So let's see, did, did those disciplines help Zechariah grow? Let's find out. Looking again at Luke 1, this time verse 57. Here's after the nine months. It says, when it was time for Elizabeth to have her baby, she gave birth to a son. There's John the Baptist, huh? Next verse. On the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child. And they were going to name him after his father. But his mother spoke up and said, no, no. No, he is to be called John. The tradition was that you name your child after the father. Everybody did this. And so the people at the temple who were doing the circumcision just assumed that he would be Zechariah like dad. And mom had to jump in, mom, because dad can't talk yet, and say, no, 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 the angel told us his name is to be John. Verse 61, they said to her, there is no one among your relatives who has that name. Then they made signs to his father to find out what he would like to name the child. They're assuming that Elizabeth is going rogue, and clearly Zechariah disagrees with his wife. It says in verse 63 that Zechariah asked for a writing tablet, and to everyone's astonishment, he wrote, his name is John. Can, can I... Uh, just imagine this with you. So they would have like a slate, a writing tablet. This is the only way that John had to communicate. He'd grab a piece of chalk and he'd scratch his message. And friends, when he wrote, his name is John, that was a glorious moment of obedience. The angel had said, name him John. Zechariah was obeying. Now let's take a look at what happens as a result. Verse 64, immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue set free and he began to speak, praising God. Isn't that beautiful? I, I, I made an observation as I was reflecting on this. You know, the, the, the angel had said that once the baby is born, you'll be able to talk. The baby was born and for eight days, he still wasn't able to talk. Zechariah must have been wondering, like, am I ever going to talk again? Well, it didn't matter if he was ever going to talk again or not. He was now going to obey God. The angelic message was a sign of his immaturity nine months earlier when he said, I don't believe it. But now the angelic message, which came with an instruction, name him John, became a place of maturity, of, a, of faith, of obedience expressed nine months later. What does this mean? God could have linked his speaking to the actual birth of the child, but God chose to link his start to speak again to his obedience, to show that the discipline worked, Zechariah. You are a more mature man. You're obeying. And this, this slate that says his name is John was just a picture of the obedience, the growth in our friend Zechariah. Friends, he grew, and so will we. When we impose self-disciplines on us, when God imposes discipline on us, may each of us enjoy the miraculous transformation into a better person, a stronger person, a more Christ-like person through 
discipline. Let's pray, shall we? God, we thank you so much for hardship, for the role that it plays in growing us. I can't believe I said that, but it's true. We do thank you. We rejoice. We consider it joy when we face hardships of many kinds. Because, Lord, with you, they do grow us up. Don't let us get soft, God. Don't let us seek the cushy, soft life. Not just by your spirit to embrace the disciplines you bring, and not just by your spirit to implement the disciplines in our daily routine that you would have us bring. And may all of these challenging experiences, these exercises, grow us up. God, may these coming days be days of spiritual growth, maybe like never before. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.